Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on development projects. Um, today we will be hearing from Forrest Bryfogel, but first I'd like to get started on a couple housekeeping items. As usual, this webinar is scheduled for one hour. Um, our next um, Okay, so sorry about that. Our webinar is scheduled for one hour as usual. We do encourage questions throughout the webinar as well as at the end, so be sure and text those in as they come up. Um, we will be recording this and send you an email as well as a copy of the slides, so please be on the lookout for that. Again, as I mentioned, today we will be hearing from Forrest Bryfogel. Forrest is the CEO of Smarter Solutions and a professional a engineer, ASQ fellow, and serves on the Board of Advisors for the University of Texas Center for Performance Excellence. In 2004, he received the Crosby Medal for his book, Implementing Six Sigma, Second Edition. Forrest has authored or co-authored 13 books and published over 100 technical articles for well-known worldwide publications. He's the founder and CEO of Smarter Solutions, and um, he recently published the Integrated Enterprise Excellence series that we've been referencing throughout, book series that we've been referencing throughout the webinar series. So again, thank you for um, being here today, and I will turn it over to Forrest Bryfogel. Okay, it's great to be here. Uh, um, this uh, concepts we're going to be talking about uh, during the, uh, the webinar today is going to be uh, covered more in detail in the reference text in volume three of my book uh, on the integrated enterprise excellence system. And in that book, we're talking about more of the business process improvement. But we're going to be focusing on how those tools can be applied to the overall development process. Uh, not just uh, process improvement projects today. So uh, in this overall eight uh, series of webinars, uh, we're going to be uh, uh, developing uh, projects, or how do the techniques apply to uh, development projects. Uh, so basically six or series uh, in the overall series of eight. So for, before we get started here, I'd like to uh, ask a question uh, for you to see how um, You've been using Lean Six Sigma concepts in the design effort, so uh, please uh, select one of the uh, following responses for that particular question. Thank you. Okay. So it looks like we're pretty much done here. Okay, what have we come up with here? Okay, so it looks like about 57% uh, of you here have done some, and 29% uh, frequently, and 14% regularly. Okay, well, thank you for your response. Okay, in this particular uh, webinar, we're going to be uh, focusing on uh, the application of some tools within the overall development project. And the tools that we're going to be focusing on are uh, QFD, design of experiments, uh, control charts, and some basic statistics. Okay, now when do you have a development project, basically, in Lean Six Sigma? Well, we like to think whenever it's new. You could have a new product, okay, so you consider you make computers. And so all of a sudden, I got a new um, product that's coming out. How do you apply design for Six Sigma or, or Six Sigma techniques and Lean Six Sigma techniques in the product development process? Well, let's consider uh, line item two there. What about we're developing a new process? Uh, perhaps we've never done a call center before, at least in uh, maybe India or some other part of the world, and we'd like to set up an efficient call center within their culture, perhaps. And So that's a new process. So how do we apply uh, design for Six Sigma techniques within setting up a new process. Or another one might be an IT solution. I know that uh, 
you perhaps never had this problem, but I've heard other people do, is uh, maybe somebody, sometimes when somebody uh, or a group develops an IT solution, it just does not turn out the way we plan it. So how can you perhaps improve that performance of IT uh, solution development uh, in other companies that have this kind of problem? So, Okay, well, let's look at the big picture. In, uh, the Integrated Enterprise Excellence System, uh, we talked about the enterprise process, our e to make system. So that's a nine-step business system. And uh, whenever we get to the improved phase, we can either take on process improvement projects, which is described by the Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, Control roadmap within uh, um, our overall system, or you can go in and do a design process. And that's what we're going to be focusing primarily this time, is dealing with the design for IEEE, or sometimes people call it design for Six Sigma. OK, if we look at the value chain, uh, which is the, uh, it's with the value chain here that's shown, um, where does this fit within the overall big picture? Well, the value chain basically is uh, the define under the define and measure aspect of the overall enterprise to make system. Now, if you go in and look at how does the development uh, aspect fit within the overall um, value chain that most organizations have, uh, it's kind of circled there. You know, after we get voice of the customer, we can develop product and market product, sell product, produce invoice and report financials. So the question is, how do we apply Lean Six Sigma tools within the overall developed product particular uh, function? The other one I've got circled there is the IT group. You know, how can we go in and apply these techniques within uh, information technology? Okay, if um, in, when we're developing a new project, uh, the question is what is <clears throat> designed for Six Sigma, or like I said, or what do we call design for IEEE? It's basically actions that create somewhat of a, a system, really to go in and uh, look at how you're putting it all together when you're actually designing uh, something new or designing a new process. And we're looking at things that are more somewhat revolutionary. They're just somewhat different. Sometimes people go in and think about design for Six Sigma whenever they're doing a design of experiments in a manufacturing operation. We're not quite looking at it that way. That's kind of tweaking the knobs. We're looking at things that are somewhat different. You know, like I said, we're designing a new product, or we're designing a new process, or an IT project. So these are somewhat different. And it's not like you're going to get a continual feedback on any one of these activities, but it's going to be uh, somewhat of a project-based system once you decide what you're going to do. And you want to use and integrate the Lean Six Sigma tools within this overall system of doing work. Now, the roadmap we typically follow or suggest is the demand view road, roadmap, or define, measure, analyze, design, and verify. Now, let's look at what each one of these steps within this overall roadmap means. We're looking at defining the goals and expectation for the customer, okay, or the outcome. What are we really expecting with all this? But then now we get into measure. Okay, we're looking at uh, what are we going to measure and determine for the customer. Uh, this is dealing with the needs, wants, and desires, and that's really important. Now, <clears throat> often when we get into the project to make roadmap, we talk about voice of the customer, and it's important. However, I think it's really important when we're looking at development projects. So we're going to be focusing on that a lot. How do we really meet the needs of the customer? Because sometimes we go in and develop a product or a process, and we think we develop the needs of the pro uh, customer, but in reality, we didn't do such a good job. OK, then we want, under the analyze phase, to determine how we're actually going to meet the customer needs. And then we're going to design the product to address those needs. And then we want to verify that, in fact, we really did a good job of meeting their needs and goals. Now, you might say, whenever we're doing this, we're 
not really different than someone that does a design project. And that's somewhat true. However, what we're trying to do here is provide the structure for going in and doing a project. <clears throat> now, often what happens in a development project or process is we'll create a project manager. Now, a lot of the details of actually doing the work on developing a new product is up to the project manager. But in reality, what we'd like to do is create a system so that the actual process of developing the product is not so different to attend uh, between the different uh, project manager you have. So we want to create somewhat of a robust process for the overall development process. So you know, as you know, we're on Smarter Solutions, we're really big on roadmaps. And that's what we're trying to do here, is provide somewhat of a roadmap for efficiently accomplishing these tasks. Now, if we look at some of the DMAIC tools that fit in within this overall development process, what we would have here is voice of the customer and the KO model. And we'd have quality function deployment, or QFD, process mapping would be something that's really important. And also, uh, you know, value stream mapping we kind of put together in, in that overall uh, 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 category is process mapping. We also have design of experiments. Now, these can take some different spins than you do within perhaps the manufacturing process where perhaps you've applied these techniques or learned about these techniques previously. Now, we're also going to be covering uh, various hypothesis testing and F testings. And, and make some other comparison testings along the way, too. Because sometimes what you think you might be getting in design uh, work for relative to testing is not quite what you might think it might is. Now, we're not going to, in this session, get into teaching all these tools. We're basically going to be focusing on how somebody might apply these techniques. Now, most of the tools are covered in volume three of my book. Uh, except for QFD. Now, QFD has gone into some details in uh, my earlier book in implementing Six Sigma, the second edition. Now, let's first talk about the voice in the customer and the Kano model. Now, before you begin your design effort, you really need to basically understand the customer. That's basically their needs and wants and desires and the cost and the time frame and other constraints that you might have that uh, basically um, impact that overall customer need picture. And it's really important to address the, the needs of the customer. Sometimes we can answer the wrong question to the third decimal place and find out that uh, even though we thought it was really neat, the customer didn't end up buying it. I can remember my uh, uh, old days within IBM, uh, we developed something that was uh, in the 70s that was really slick. It was a recording device. Uh, that was before we had uh, personal computers around a lot. And uh, it was uh, uh, three and a quarters inch diameter disk. It was a magnetic media. So you could just about record a letter on there. Well, we, th we had a slick design, but gee whiz, guess what? Nobody ended up buying it. They ended up buying the uh, little cassette players, which we didn't think were near as nice as this, but either because we didn't have good marketing for this in, within IBM or um, for whatever reason, it just didn't sell. So uh, we need to focus on what would really sell and meet the customer's overall needs. Now, when we're looking at this, we can go in and do the Kano model. And that looks at the needs that the customer has. That's dealing with kind of the basic requirements, what they have. And then the wants. This is performance requirement. And then also the desires or delighters. Now, a lot of times the customer doesn't really ask what they really need. Now, this is even before my time, you know. So, uh, in the olden days, that you could start cars with a crank start, you know, and the customer wouldn't even think of any other way of starting the car. But boy, were they delighted whenever you could start the car from the inside of the car with a push button. So uh, we need to keep in mind not just asking what the customer wants, but let's keep our innovation in mind what they might really need and that might really become a delighter for them. So the, under the stand in the Kano model is that's focused on the needs, wants, and desires. And that puts it into perspective. So we want to really want to design something that uh, everyone's going to need. But sometimes we miss that. And we want to also uh, keep in mind the budget. Because sometimes we might have something that's designed that has all the bells and whistles on it, but it's flat, too expensive, and nobody's going to buy it. And you know, make the, you can also have a problem that we 
really try to boil the ocean. We make the design so complicated that it never gets completed, and we just keep chugging at it and redesigning it because the voice of the customer changed. So we want to have something we can get done in a timely fashion so that it really addresses their needs, and guess what? That we make money at it. Okay, here I got question two. So uh, please go in and uh, answer the question in front of you, and we'll see how uh, people out there are thinking about these particular responses. Okay, we've got about 10% of voted. Come on, let's go in and vote here, please. Okay, we've got about 50% of you. Let's give it a couple more seconds here. Okay, we've got about 80% voted. Let's see what, what uh, we got here. Okay, customer interviews. It looks like a, that's a, a pretty big one. Well, it looks like it's almost... A, Pretty flat distribution there. Audits and customer complaints. Ah, that's an interesting one. It's kind of a low one there. And market research. Those are kind of the two lowest ones. Okay. Well, good. Well, thank you for your response here. Okay. So um, these are the th type of things that um, you can get voice of the customer in there. And uh, I want to, but we need to have a process for putting all this together. You know, it's nice and easy to say that. But, you know, to me, I'm a big process thinker like you probably are, too. How can we put together this an overall process? You know, and I was uh, given a keynote here the other uh, uh, a few months ago. So I put together this slide here, and they wanted me to line voice the customer to the overall business system. So uh, I put down uh, together a drill down, and, uh, and, and notice here in our value chain, we've got voice the customer at the front end. And this is a graphic that I put together on how a process that you might be able to do it. So now you can go in and, and put a swim lanes to complaints and the audits and the surveys, internal surveys, and so on. Now, if you notice at the end of each one of those steps, I have something that says uh, the effect that document the results in the data warehouse. And you notice the bottom swim lane has data warehouse. So the, the idea behind this whole thing is that um, we take all this information and we put it in a warehouse, and then we can kind of use that as voice of the customer. You know, we can have social media in here, looking at how the uh, inputs that are coming out there, what, what they think about the competition, and so on. And that's uh, one thing to do ad hoc, but I'm suggesting we need to be a more formal system in the front end of that, so now we're not just waiting till we come out with a new product and get ideas, and we're going to do some audits and uh, surveys and so on. But we have a data warehouse that really gives us insight to what we ought to do for new products and for other things, for that matter. You know, one of the things that I've got in here is complaints. You know, I'm uh, I get I don't know if you've ever had this problem or not, but I get upset about certain things, and I write letters to CEO, and all they try to do is come back and answer and get me uh, off of their case and. And get, they don't look at that as a real opportunity because I venture to say if I'm complaining about it, there's other people that are too. And uh, also when surveys, I've noticed, I've sometimes had uh, issues with that, really not liking a service or a product. And I'm going to nail them on the survey. And then it looks like all the survey questions are that they want to get a positive answer. You know, and they really don't want my feedback. All they want is uh, fives on everything. Uh, saying that, gee whiz, they've done a really good job. So what we really want to have is an honest way of getting real good customer feedback so that as part of our overall business system. Okay, now one way we can go in and take that information when we do have a uh, voice of the customer is to go in and put use quality function appointment. But boy, you've got to be careful of this one. You can really get them down to rat holes, and this can be a monster if you're not careful. So you've got to keep it at a level... That's not uh, too much details, but details enough. So uh, we just that's just a word of warning if you've never done one. They can be uh, a lot of work, and all of a sudden you get done. It's not done in a timely fashion, and also uh, it's more details than you plan, and sometimes it doesn't give what you want. So keep in mind we need to go in and focus on making this so it's beneficial um, to what we're trying to take on and not become a, a black hole for time. Okay, so the quality function deployment has some various aspects. And now what we're trying to take all the customer requirements that we talked about previously, and we put on the left-hand side of that matrix, okay? Now, if you notice on the right-hand side of that matrix, what we've got is customer satisfaction and also the market. 
So what we're really going to try to do is look at our competition and try to quantify how we're doing relative to the competition. And also we're going to, at the top of the matrix, we're going to look at characteristics. And those are the things that we're looking at as an output of what our overall uh, device or the thing that we're trying to do uh, is to provide. And we then build some relationships of that. And then we get some sort of ranking, and it gets to the technical importance, and kind of gives us an idea of, of what really is important relative to the how. Because what we're trying to look at here is how are we going to meet customer requirements. And that's what we're trying to do is get some sort of a prioritization of things that we ought to be focused on. Because some of the hows we may find out we think are really important, but relative to meeting the customer requirements uh, is not really what's uh, needed right now. Now what you really want to do is have somewhat of a cascading effect. So you can see we got the uh, first matrix on the left is pretty much what we talked about before. But now we've got the uh, critical to quality issues at the top of the matrix. Okay, now you see when those critical quality um, uh, items, they go down and to the uh, next matrix. And then that leads to the requirements at the top. So they're both in yellow there, as you can see. And then we go in and take the requirements, and we move down to the design features. So that's what we really want to do, is have the design features. In the bottom of that matrix on the right-hand side, it actually should be providing the specs. So I think you can visualize um, how that cascading effect can uh, uh, really uh, uh, take a significant amount of time if you're not careful. Now, in my book, Implementing Six Sigma Second Edition, I go in and talk about uh, uh, one just one piece of the uh, automobile uh, that you're looking at here at uh, dealing with the door. And I mean, it's quite a bit involved in this door uh, just for creating a quality function deployment uh, matrix there. So just kind of be careful on what you're doing when you're or looking at it. But one way or the other, we want to get to design requirements on how we're going to get there. Now, the next question thing we talked about here is like design of experiments. Well, this is a, you know, a, a concept that I have a passion about. Uh, in 75, I basically changed my life by taking a design experiment class when I worked at development within within IBM. So I have a real passion for this. But we need to be careful. If we got a hammer, let's don't make everything a nail. So uh, design of experiments can uh, be one of those kind of tools. So I think it's really applicable in certain situations. The situations that I, I think it's mostly applicable to is whenever we want to uh, evaluate if something uh, should be changed or not, or or the level of the of the, the items, and um, you know it's it's really important in the right place at the right time. Now, if we look at design of experiments, it can be uh, very applicable in screening design. So the idea on screening design is we want to determine which factors are really the most important, and kind of weed out those other ones that are just not so important. Now, parameter design, we want to look at and determine what the nominal value. So in design, we want to go in and try to look at where's the optimal setting that we should be having for these particular designs parameters. So this could be maybe even a temperature of a process that we're having, our particular dimension. We want to evaluate that. So that involved parameter design. Now, tolerance design says, well, gee whiz, how tight should the tolerance or how loose can we have the tolerance be? Okay, so but you can kind of look at this and say, boy, if you're not careful, this could be a big monster of a task too. And because uh, I, I at IBM, I eventually moved to the uh, test group, product test of new products. That was the early 80s. It was a long time ago, perhaps before some of you were born. But anyway, give a history thing here a little bit. But I, I applied this a lot within the testing of group. And one of the things they came up with was pass-fail functional testing. And this is a combinational testing. So you can look at hardware and software integration and see how all those things uh, uh, fit together and uh, see if you've got a, a problem or not. It's a, it's a very slick approach, I think. Uh, uh, it's a very different approach to a design of experiments. But you use design of experiments matrices to go in and find if you have combinational problems that don't work together. I know you've never, probably never had this problem in your computer, but whenever you do certain things, the thing just flat doesn't work with the software and hardware. So I, I appreciate it. I'm not very good at telling jokes, but I, I uh, uh, but I appreciate any chuckles out there that you might have. So uh, even though I can't hear you, I appreciate it anyway. So so anyway, now um, how does design of experiments kind of fit in the overall picture here? 
Okay, the IEEE roadmap is shown on the left-hand side there. And um, in design of experiments, uh, where we've got the uh, factors at the top um, and um, the trials down on the, the rows, uh, we often apply that in the prove phase. So that's where we often uh, associate it with in the, the make roadmap, for the project to make roadmap. However, it can be very useful also in the, um, the fine phase. Like when you're doing the front end, of the uh, deciding what you're going to do for your particular product. So you can start asking questions and, and build that basically around the design of experiment matrix. Now, another application is uh, the design optimization. This is dealing with the, um, uh, the optimizations that you have, the pr basically the parameter and tolerance designs that you can come up with for your designing your new product that you're coming up with. And uh, you can also use it for process design. You know, to go in and uh, uh, make sure that the process that you're given is actually given what you think it would be. Now, the other piece that you can apply it is in verification test, and that's where I uh, uh, I worked at IBM both in the design and the verification process. So I applied it a lot in the uh, design phase. I can remember one time uh, we were having a product that was going to uh, manufacturing. And there was a significant problem, uh, and it wasn't discovered really until we started using production hardware. But I was able to use design of experiments to quantify that uh, the motor was really the problem, and the only way I could fix it with, with, was with a, a head pad where the media fixed. So I was able to use within uh, designing a new product when I was handing it off to test, uh, and, and I didn't really go in and um, find the problem. We didn't find the problem until late in the overall uh, development process of testing the new products. And then I moved to uh, verify the test, and I started using design of experiments within uh, verification uh, phase of uh, testing a new product. So in this particular case, we had a test. It was a sheet feed device, and at that time, uh, uh, sheet feed devices were not near as reliable as they are not now. But uh, sheet feed devices are really rather more complicated and harder to do than you might think uh, because uh, especially when you have to deal with uh, various temperature and humidity conditions. So I use those as factors when testing the new products. Uh, and also we had different paper weights and things like that that really made a big difference. So uh, uh, part of the factors we used with verifying was uh, dealing with the temperature and humidity conditions. We had the paper weight. You had different uh, feed roller settings and things like that. And you wanted to make sure that it would work in various combinations that you had. Now I've got uh, something else that I'll be talking about a little bit later here is uh, uh, DCRCA. That's uh, a DOE Collective Response Capability Assessment. Uh, because now what we can look at as a response uh, for the output of the factors, we can actually set up the design so that it's dealing with factor levels that are typically what the customer would experience. So for example, you'd have temperature and humidity conditions. You would have high and low level conditions for those. And you'd have also tolerance settings for feed rollers and so on. So if you were going to look at a response, uh, it may not be just pass or fail, but it could be a continuous response. So whenever we're doing the various trials in the matrix, we may have outputs that represent the basic space of, or factor level that represent the space of what the customer might experience. Okay, so now if you looked at the outputs of those and basically did a probability plot on those, then you could get an idea of how the response uh, that you might see in the field. And if they're doing relatively well, uh, compared to the overall specification, then you feel it real good. But if they don't, you don't feel so good. So that's uh, something else I found to be real helpful. OK, so uh, you basically should have exposed to design of experiments in your Lean Six Sigma uh, class. And we're talking about how do you pick the levels and the selection of the methods, and how you test new design, and then the interpretation of the results, which is basically what I kind of netted out on the previous slide. OK, let's move on to control charts and statistics. Now, how basically are you going to include those? Uh, too many uh, development efforts really don't look at the statistical um, concepts 
in small sample size. Well, I can remember when I was uh, basically an internal consultant within IBM from 1980 to 92, where that's basically what I did full time, uh, wasn't assigned a project in 12 years. And most people seem to come to ask me for help. They ask, what sample size do I need? I said, well, fundamentally, you're not going to like the, the answer. You know, It's going to be way too large. And then secondly, you can't actually do what you want to do. Let's say, for example, you want to do a reliability test. So how many do I need? Well, I can crank that out, and I can also tell you how many failures you could allow. But for one thing, uh, you're violating what you think you might have. Uh, you think you got a random sample. Well, you really don't. You don't have a random sample of population that you're interested in, which is the future. So you really need to start thinking about doing things a little differently um, on that. And also, you would like to go in and adjust performance, long-term performance. And how can you go in and do 30,000 for level metrics on that? And, and I'm suggesting there's some ways that you can. Maybe you can look at history data from previous products that might give you a better idea than just, just testing testing a lot and uh, trying to look at how many failures you get. And, um, and most people don't really like to talk about the future risk that statistics may show them. But man, it's real. So let's go in and look at a couple situations here. Let's go, uh, look at a situation where you build five prototypes to test. Now, prototypes are expensive. So you can say, well, I'd like 100. Well, yeah, you may like 100, but they could cost you know a couple hundred thousand dollars a piece. So you can't really afford that, and they're very expensive. Now, each testing is looked for functionally um, a pass-fail. Now, let's say all five meets requirements. Now, what is the probability that you're going to have that you're going to have a good product that's going to really meet your needs? So we're going to focus this on putting it in a statistical term here. So based on a good, on five good, out of five prototypes, Estimate the worst case long-term defective rate that you might experience. So this is a question for you. So let's see what you come away with here. OK, don't be shy. There we go. We got a few people voted here. OK, you got 40%, so you got 50%. Come on, put your number down there now. OK, 70%. Looks like that's all we're going to get out there. OK, let's go see what it turned out to be. OK, we got, let's see, uh, boy, it looks like almost a dis dif distribution here of between 5, 10, 20, and 40. OK, well, let's see what we come away with there. OK, if we go in and do stat basic statistics, one proportion, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Let's look at the confidence interval on that. That's an upper rate of 45%. Wow. Okay, well, that's not as good as you might think of it would be. So, you know, basically testing five of them like this is uh, not going to give you what the confidence that you might think. So, you know, perhaps you need to actually do it a different way. You know, maybe you can stress it to failure. You know, then you at least got a continuous response. However, you still don't have a random sample of the future, and that still gets to be a real problem there. Let's look at another situation. You design and test a new electronic device build 10 prototypes to test it. Now, each one of these is tested for a maximum test, test temperature, I'll get it out there, during the operation. Now, all 10 meets the requirements, but this time you collect continuous data. So like I said, that's a better way of doing it. OK, let's look at a predict a long-term 1% defective rate. Now, let's see what we came up with this. Oh, OK. We got 1% of the population. Well, we get a pretty a lot better approach on that. But is this correct? Is this correct? Well, what happens if we could have got basically a time series plot of that? Now, if they're all in the same batch, we really don't have a time series plot. But let's say that there's 10 different batches and they're done in sequence. Well, in this particular case, oh, look what that chart tells us. It's kind of moving up to the top level. It's uh, really out of control. So the probability plot on the right-hand side, you know, you may think that's OK. However, gee whiz, our process could be really out of control. And so it could have a lot of variability associated with it. So we just got to really be careful on how we're actually doing it. So again, this is uh, you know, what uh, we might uh, uh, find that comes from our, uh, our analysis here. So. Just keep in mind that we can need to throw the statistics in there to make sure what we got. I, I remember that I, uh, you know, went in and did um, 
uh, we we like to do like reliability tests where we go in and protect both the alpha and beta risk. Boy, boy, does that get to be big of sample size. And then I got a reduced sampling test where you could go in and and look at that, how that would turn out to be. But even that requires very large sample sizes and long test time. But on that, what you, what you come away with is your, uh, the way I did at least, that you're protecting the, uh, the consumer. But in reality, uh, for reasonable sample size, you might have to have that sample perform two or three times better than the specification before you can uh, uh, actually say that it meets it, meets the needs. However, even then, that's not really a great test because it's not a random sample of the population you're interested in, which is really the future. So keep in mind, control charts and statistics, we really often, especially in development, we underutilize these methodologies in the development efforts. We often do not have a, enough data points in this control chart, and often those are prototypes, and sometimes when we get out to the real world, it's quite different than what we've done in, in some of these short-run operations. Also, how do we look at really what the supplier is going to provide, because that provides a very important part of it. And a lot of times, whenever we're testing it out, we don't get to see that all part of that variability in this overall test group here. So. Uh, uh, sometimes we look at it as uh, uh, we might be able to look at it as a, a, a previous design and learn from that because sometimes that's really helpful. And a lot of times they actually have the attitude, hey, we're the designers. Let's manufacture and worry about uh, the, the methodology of finding out the details. Somehow, somehow it sometimes gets thrown across the wall, and that's not a good, good idea either. Okay, so let's look at... Uh, some unique spins for this um, uh, development process. And I kind of alluded to this DCRSA a uh, methodology earlier. So in the design phase, we could use DOE for optimization for the QFD needs. So uh, how could we go in and do that? Well, we could kind of go in and set things to uh, the high and low level, especially in the verification test. And that's why I alluded to this DCRCA methodology where we set things to the high and low levels for the factors and their levels, and then we look at the overall output. And, and I'm big on probability plots. And if we just do a probability plot of that without analyzing it and compare that to tolerance, and if we're well within the tolerance, pretty, uh, that's pretty good, and we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> However, if it's not, that can go in and give us an indication of what particular factors that we need to focus on to really tighten up the tolerances and see what we might do so it better meets the needs of the customer at the end. Also, this technique, the DCRCA, can be used to hand off the manufacturing. You know, that uh, uh, sometimes we just go in and uh, leave everything nominal and we say, well, if it's running and hold our breath for a few hours, then we say, great, wonderful. But let's go in and, if we can, start tweaking the knobs and find out various extremes and see if it gives us what we want uh, down the road. Uh, so I think that that's a better approach, if at all, we could possibly do that. Okay, well, now we're at the summary here. We described the uh, development projects. We had, uh, again, we talked about the uh, uh, a product, a new product. Or we had a new process, or we had a new IT project. Uh, relative to the tools, we got into quality function deployment. Uh, we got into how you could apply design of experiments, and then we uh, also got into control charts and basic statistics here on how we might be able to open people's eyes to uh, some of the risks that they are, they are taking. Okay, so that's about all I've got for today. Now let's look at questions we might have. Yep, please submit any questions. We'll start with our first question. Um, can you give me an example of how a development group can benefit from pass-fail functional testing? Okay. Uh, Pass-fail functional testing is described in implementing Six Sigma in the second edition. Uh, to give you an idea of this, if we go in and look at seven factors, and, and we uh, now the factor might be, I'm going to test it when you're going to uh, say it's software. I'm going to have um, a high activity on a, a network line versus low activity, and I may have uh, that could be one factor. Another factor may be um, I'm going to have uh, two different uh, uh, types of computers or something, and then you know keeps going down the road. So I got seven factors, and let's say we did eight combinations of those. Now, if you look at um, um, 
I describe this type of failure, pass-fail functional testing, as combinational problems. You know, it's kind of like whenever you say you have a problem, you say, whenever I do this in my software and I do that and this other thing together, they don't have a pro they have a problem. So that's a combination of three things. It's not seven things. You know, let's say we we're looking at three things combination of that. So it might be factor A high, uh, B low, and D high. You know, and if you look at all those combinations, there's like 280 of them, I believe. Now, if we went in and ran eight trials of seven factors, we'd have 90% coverage of the 280 possible combinations. So I found that to be very beneficial to, uh, you know, to see if you have problems. Now, it doesn't really tell you what the problem is, but it says, hey, trial number three failed, and somebody else have to go figure out what it is. And typically, whenever you say trial three failed and the other trials pass, then somebody that has insight to the overall uh, product can figure out what it is. So that kind of nets out pass-fail functional testing. And then uh, that's just giving you an example of two levels. Now, we've got software that can handle any number of factors in any number of levels. Okay, we've got another. The next question. When planning a pilot that includes a possibility of a merger, which tool will benefit the pilot? Well, I like to, uh, whenever you start thinking about um, looking at a merger, and I'm, I, I'm immediately thinking design of experiments, okay, where now you're looking at, um, you know, um, and I'm not sure if you're talking about a, a two different companies merging or not, but, um, you know, because that could even be a factor here, too, on how they do it. So to me, I immediately come and start thinking about um, design of experiments because we have to get a response. You know, and then we're looking at the factors, and when you say merger or not, or different things that they're doing in this merger, then we could look at design of experiments and to try to decide uh, which one of the factors and settings uh, of this merger is the most important. So immediately, um, I think the design of experiments that could uh, benefit for the pilot. Okay, I think those were all the questions. If you have any more, please submit them. We have a few more minutes. If not, we will wrap up for today. Okay, well, that looks like uh, all the questions. So I've enjoyed being here with you. And uh, um, uh, if you got any other offline questions, be sure, as Mallory suggested, uh, submitting to us. So uh, um, hope you have a perfect day out there.